When we were young and carefree, our imaginations were vivid and lively, filled with colourful and creative ideas. We had an innate ability to tap into a world that was much more enchanting and wondrous than the one we inhabit today. Our young minds were able to conjure up magical scenarios and moments of awe inspiring wonder with ease. But as we grew older, something changed and that magic slowly began to fade away. We often wonder what happened to the enchanting world of our childhood and why we lost our connection to it. Perhaps it was the pressures of the adult world, with its emphasis on practicality and rationality, that slowly chipped away at our childlike wonder. Or maybe it was simply the passage of time, as we became more immersed in the responsibilities and demands of daily life. Regardless of the cause, the loss of that sense of magic and wonder can be disheartening. It's natural to long for the days when our imaginations knew no bounds, and we could escape into a world of pure possibility. Children smile about 400 times per day on average, while adults only smile an average of 20 times per day. Where did we learn not to smile as much as we once did? Children today spend the first seven years of their life in the alpha brainwave frequency and after that, when the programming that they have been bombarded with from their environment starts ticking in, they switch to beta brainwave frequency and stay there throughout the rest of their lives. Most of us awake in the morning by around 6.30 am, by an alarm clock. We leap out of bed, shower, brush our teeth and hair, eat and get dressed. We fight traffic to get to a job where we work 40 hours per week in order to be able to afford basic necessities. By 4.30 p.m. we are done working and fight traffic again to get home just in time for sunset. We probably watch TV and go to bed and then we repeat this cycle day after day for the rest of our lives with an occasional short annual vacation at best. We are so burned out that our duties aren't personally fulfilling anymore but we are caught in a system where we have to trade our time for survival. We can see how parents condition their kids for a life of pressure and urgency day after day when they get their kids ready for school in the morning. First thing in the morning before the sun fully arises kids around the world are being rushed. All this is conditioning so they can be prepared in their later life to get ready for the corporate world. This pattern constitutes the substance of most of our lives along with various opinions we hold about religion, politics, news, entertainment and the social roles we play in relation to the external world. Most have accepted the work, eat, entertainment, sleep cycle as life and have no desire for a deeper understanding of our purpose in this universe. We trade our time for the rest of our lives in order to acquire a car and a shelter at best. Then we die and leave the things we worked all of our life to accomplish. Hardly anyone is wondering what we're actually doing on this planet. Many of us have completely bought into this construct built around us, a construct that contributes to a perception of pressure and urgency. We have been raised under a system that keeps us locked into a perception of pressure and urgency, which keeps us in beta brainwave frequency and in turn locks us to the lower dimensions of fear. We now become so conditioned to this state of being that we see it as normal. Consider a typical day in the life of a regular individual. You awaken in the morning thinking about a situation in your life. You're feeling a little down because of your thoughts concerning this outside issue. A certain language and hesitation in your emotions characterize this mood. You go to get a cup of coffee and drop the glass carelessly. Angry at yourself, you feel the impulse to lash out at someone or anything. You decide to leave the house because you figure why not make up for it right away. You occasionally go out with your buddies to a chic cafe. Even though the morning's hassles are still fresh in your mind, you can already taste how wonderful this coffee is. Two women are seated at the table across from you. While looking at you, the attractive blonde can be heard whispering to her partner, He is the kind of man I like. You internally savor the remarks that were unintentionally overheard and possibly purposefully said aloud about you. Imagine that you were asked right now if it had been worthwhile to get upset and angry over the morning's irritations. You would most likely would say yes, it was worth it. Do you notice how meeting the blonde you were interested in and who was attracted to you changed the way you felt? You made your way back home while humming. Even the sight of the shattered glass only makes you smile. When you pick up the phone to call the blonde you just met, the wrong number is dialed. When you call again, the same person answers. When a man accuses you of pestering him, you respond that it was not your fault. You describe yourself as stupid. You should hear the tone of voice in which you criticize the newspaper man as he brings you the paper as this incites a tempest of outrage. You've been waiting to read some wonderful news for a while, and it's in the paper. You find the paper's contents to be so fascinating as you read that your annoyance eventually fades. You are in the happiest of moods when you finish reading the paper. I could continue this picture of your day. This way of relating to the world causes us to become victims of our environment. 
Our environment tells us what to think, then our thoughts tell us what to feel, then our feeling indicates our vibration and then our vibration selects our frequency. To have our environment as the stimulus that causes our thoughts is the wrong use of the brain and of the power of thoughts. We have the hierarchy backwards. When the hierarchy is backwards, we find ourselves detached from our whole selves. The hierarchy was intended to be laid out in the opposite direction with our frequency causing our vibration, our vibration causing our emotions, our emotion causing our thoughts and our thoughts causing our physical reality. Therefore, I propose an original and comprehensive theory, that of a dominance hierarchy of the subjective worlds of humans, consisting of consciousness, frequency, vibration, emotions, thoughts and physical reality. It places thoughts closer to the bottom of this hierarchy proposing that to access a better life in this present age, thoughts should be one of the last things humans seek to change. It places emotions and frequency above thoughts and proposes that if these higher order subjective elements changes, everything else at the bottom of the hierarchy including thoughts must naturally fall in line, eliminating the need to focus on the fragmented patterns of the lower faculties. This is a very radical and alternate view in our rational minded driven world today. People prefer to try to change their physical reality first and if that doesn't work, then they try changing their thoughts. We haven't yet come to the understanding that frequency dominates emotions and thoughts and physical reality. The dominance hierarchy of the subjective elements of humans. Physical reality follows thought. Thought follows emotions. Emotions follow frequency. Frequency follows consciousness. Consciousness follows only itself. This is the correct order of the hierarchy but by focusing externally and learning everything we know from external sources, we have made our environments the cause and ourselves the effect, but in actuality, we should be the cause and our environment the effect. This backwards flip of the hierarchy has turned reality into something quite different than what was intended. We have allowed the ego, whose sole purpose is to navigate the external world, to become overly developed and specialized. Maslow's hierarchy of needs suggests that unless an individual can satisfy their physiological needs which include food, water, air and sleep, their safety needs which include money, resources, health and property, their love and belonging needs which include family and social connections and esteem needs which include respect, status and recognition, an individual cannot become self-actualized. Self-actualization refers to the desire to become the most that one can be. In other words, Maslow suggests that once those needs are met, only then can an individual become self-actualized. But what the theory of the ascension of consciousness suggests is that those needs don't have to be met before a person becomes all that they can be, but that those levels of existence can be transcended. And in the actualization of the person they then become able to meet those needs without much effort. Hence, the theory of the ascension of consciousness, a top-down approach. What Maslow's theory suggests is that humans are the sum total of their social roles and accomplishments but the reality is that, as long as they haven't risen above these levels of existence, most people only exist as predictable equations reacting rather than acting, warping compendiums of aphorisms and taboos, reflexes and syndromes, an ironic spectacle of robots fancying themselves free. But when finally, the embodied consciousness rises above the pain-pressure principle of the three-dimensional world, then the true meaning of freedom is made apparent. We exist in order that we may become something more than we are, not through favorable circumstances or auspicious occurrence, but through an inner search for an increased awareness to become. A person who lives through reaction to the world is the victim of every change in their environment, now happy, now sad, now victorious, now defeated, affected but never affecting. You may live many years in this manner, wrapped with sensory perception and the ups and downs of your surface self, but one day pain so outweighs pleasure that you suddenly perceive your ego is a loser, a product of outside circumstances. Only then will most people be ready to turn away from the senses and seek inner awareness. Psychiatrists are saying that way too many people today are suffering from depression. Depression rates are increasing on a yearly basis and they are not getting the desired responses from serotonin receptors in patients using the standard medications designed to ease depression. The World Health Organization reported that between 2005 and 2015, the number of people suffering from depression has increased by over 18%. There is an almost unanimous agreement among scientists that the current serotonin treatment hypothesis is flawed or at best, incomplete. Governments, NGOs, activists, psychiatrists and scientists are trying their best to encourage further research for more effective methods of treating depression. They are now experimenting with the effects of CBD, psilocybin mushrooms and DMT for depression treatment. The region of our brain responsible for the ego is called the default mode network, an area of the brain that activates by default. This part of the brain is active when our self-identity in relation to hypothetical life scenarios is active. 
It is useful in that it creates shortcuts or neural connections to help us easily navigate day-to-day -day life. But when the DMN is overactive, our anxiety causes rumination and eventually depression. When this occurs, neural connections become reinforced, leading to narrow-minded thought or low entropy. However, when the DMN is turned off, new neural connections open up leading to higher entropy. Low entropy thought includes addiction, OCD, narrow-mindedness, and depression. On the other hand, high entropy states include creative or divergent thought and psychedelic experiences. This shutdown of the DMN usually happens during meditation or under the influence of psychedelics and allows one to see new possibilities outside their narrow thought patterns. When we look at what leads people to make stress hormones today, it's not the big physical threats to our life. What causes our bodies to produce stress hormones is our perception of pressure and urgency. Pressure and urgency are our perception and has nothing to do with the real threat in our environment. We have been programmed to see our day like that. For many of us, our email inbox is a source of pressure and urgency. As humans, we have developed certain constructs that shape our daily experiences. However, these constructs can lead to feelings of overwhelm and urgency that trigger the sympathetic nervous system, otherwise known as the fight or flight response. This response is fueled by adrenaline and causes a shift in our internal biochemistry as it perceives a threat to our survival. One of the immediate effects of this response is the elevation of blood pressure, a problem that many adults in our society face. When our body is not in a state of balance or homeostasis, we activate the stress response system, which mobilizes a significant amount of our body's resources to deal with perceived threats in our external environment. This activation of the sympathetic nervous system generates a rush of adrenaline, leading to a heightened sense of awareness and readiness to take action. Unfortunately, living in a constant state of stress can have adverse effects on our health. For instance, our hearts race continuously, which can lead to long-term damage. Through conditioning, our bodies become accustomed to the stress response, and our physiological response becomes habitual. Our immune system is responsible for preventing diseases, yet stress hormones are so effective at shutting down the immune system that doctors use stress hormones therapeutically. When a foreign organ is being transplanted into a recipient, in order for the recipient's immune system to not reject it, they give the recipient stress hormones during the transplant because it's so effective at shutting down the immune system. What does that mean for the average person who is now living in stress 24-7? Our culture only teaches us how to do one thing and it pays no attention to the other significant parts of who we are. We learn to become specialists of various kinds, physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, psychotherapists, and so on, and we go through life stress, suffering from depression. Nothing in Western medical education, which is a very biologically based, now only focus, separating organs from one another, separating the mind from the body-based approach. Nothing in that type of training actually prepares us to deal with our own multidimensionality on the emotional and energetic levels. Our present culture, medicine, education, religion, business and politics only pay attention to the physical aspect of an individual, their doing and thinking, body and mind. It largely ignores the emotional aspect and does not acknowledge the energetic aspect at all. That unity of our multidimensional makeup is not embodied in our culture. Hence, most of the society's emphasis goes into damage control when situations in people's lives have already gone wrong, instead of preventing things from going wrong in the first place. Think about the many professions that exist within society and you can see that the economy is fueled by damage control. Doctors, for example, only do 25 or 40 hours at most of nutritional study in their years of medical school. The rest is spent learning how to fix various issues, whereas all that damage wouldn't need to be controlled if we really understood how to live in harmony with life in the first place. Being human is more than just the doing and thinking. We have to take into consideration the whole context of who we are. In learning how to live comfortably with ourselves, we must work with the whole system. Our high technology, in many ways brilliantly advanced systems, are lacking something that a more holistic view could very well complete. Our external accomplishments can be successful only to the degree that they are supported by a proper working internal state. There can be no external exercise which value is not subject to the internal state of the person. The inner state of the person must come first. When we only focus externally we are programmed by external influences such as childhood experiences, social learning and environmental conditioning. There is only one mind in our creation. That mind in its true state of being is not confined to anyone, not confined to the body. It is a central knowing consciousness in which everything dwells, which dwells in everything. In a bodily confined state, it assumes the limitations imposed upon it by the knowledge of itself, which it receives through the senses. But when bondage to those senses is broken by an inner power to perceive and know directly, then slavery to its embodiment is at an end. A 
person changes the state of their outer world by first changing the state of their inner world. Everything that is perceived by a person on the outside is the result of their own consciousness. When the person changes that consciousness, they alter their perception and thus the world they see and experience. You've probably come across the phrase, change your thinking, change your life. Although it is usually associated with New Age teachings, this philosophy goes as far back as 300 BC. The Greek philosopher Aristotle held the belief that thinking as directed would eliminate pain and help to attain pleasure. The current self-help industry, as well as many revered wisdom teachers, has dispensed no shortage of content on this philosophy. This ideology has etched its way into almost every crevice of our history and consciousness, and every day it seems like there is a plethora of new gurus willing to expound on the topic. It has become the most famous buzz phrase of the 21st century and every publishing house seems eager to spit out its content to awaiting audiences who receive it as excitedly as though they had struck spiritual gold. Over the years we've heard quotes like, your thoughts create your reality and practice positive thinking, yet yeah. although the content seems to make so much theoretical sense, millions of people are still unable to translate this truth into their practical day-to-day -day reality. We say, the quality of your thinking determines the quality of your life, and we try to change our thinking without much success. Look around and see whether you can locate an individual, a culture or a society free from insecurities, tensions, pressures and stresses. We suffer from anxieties, depressions, addictions, anger, resentments, loneliness, fear, unhappiness, insecurities, dissatisfaction and despair. We search for hope outside of ourselves in the form of bars, substances, churches, books, psychologists, people, philosophies and just about anything or anyone outside of ourselves that can make us feel better about ourselves on the inside. Most people are afraid they have been disempowered. The gurus, partners, safe havens, books and power structures we use to make it easier for ourselves don't actually make it easier. Although change your thinking, change your life is the teaching that probably hints closest at the truth because it points us inward for a solution to our problems, it is still only one third of an ancient truth. You must change your feeling before you can change your thinking. And you must change your frequency before you can change your feeling. That is the whole of the secret. Change your frequency. Change your life. Every school of thought or social movement that guides you towards your thoughts for change has the right idea, but essentially uses a bottom-up approach to spirituality. What that means is that, that teaching is directed towards your smaller separated self or ego which you think you are, and therefore think you are separate from a power greater than yourself. But from a top-down understanding, the power greater than yourself is the bigger part of you which you are unconscious of because of your identification with the smaller you. Prayer, mantras, affirmations and any form of spiritual practice are all done with the purpose of trying to get you aligned with a higher vibration of consciousness but will prove to be very hard work because you are swimming upstream. We built our society to honor the rational mind so even in our attempts at fixing the problems we created, we attempt to use the very instrument which caused the problem in the first place. By doing this, we add more to our problems than we add to the solution. There are more neurons in the human brain than stars inside of the galaxy. We are in the Milky Way galaxy and our twin galaxy is Andromeda. If you could see Andromeda in the night sky, it would appear to be just about the same size that our sun appears to be in the sky from our vantage point on Earth. So it would be just a small speck in the sky if it was bright enough to be visible to us. As small as Andromeda would appear to us from Earth, light, the fastest moving thing known to us, takes 65,000 years to travel from one end of Andromeda to the other. Now, try to wrap your mind around that. It takes 65,000 years for light to travel from one end to the other end. There are more neurons in our brain than there are stars within a galaxy. You can only imagine the complexity of our brains. You can't just walk up to someone and say, I think your belief is wrong and may even present them with alternate beliefs. That would not cause that that person's already held belief about something to change. That person has to have neurons of their own which already support the belief you are presenting them with. The reason why it's tough to change someone's belief is because they have spent quite a lot of time actually developing physical neural networks in the brain. So when I walk up to someone and try to challenge their belief, those physical structures in their brain that they have been gathering for quite some time don't just disappear. Simply put, it's difficult to change your thinking from the level of your thinking. This is why many of you have experienced great difficulty in changing your experiences by simply looking into a mirror and repeating affirmations. It will only afford you brief moments of freedom followed by a swift return to your original mind state. Sure you can use diamond to cut diamond, but not without it exerting its own force back. It would take a long amount of time and repetition. Let's examine how your mind functions. I'll say one sentence and you should just think of the first thing that comes to mind. Roses are red. The likelihood is that violets are blue was the first thing to come to mind. How recently did you hear that rhyme? 
you most likely learned it when you were a kid many years ago. Nevertheless, it arose automatically. Roses aren't always red, thus your response to roses are red wasn't even a critical analysis of its significance. They also come in most colors, including yellow, pink, and purple. Similarly, violets are not blue, they are violet. Your mind simply responded as though it were true. This is just one out of an indescribable amount of distorted hardwired assumptions we have picked up along our way that operates in the background of our minds unknowing to us and creates the basis of an entire fabricated reality. In trying to reframe our minds, our conscious beliefs will take the form of small waves riding on the surface of the deep expanse of our subconscious minds where all of our core subconscious beliefs are held. In order to change your thinking, you first have to transcend years of hardwired programming in the form of neural networks with connections that are as complex as the constellations of stars in our galaxy, unless your years of previous programming is somewhat supportive of your new outlook. Neuroplasticity is the ability of neural networks in the brain to change through growth and reorganization. It is when the brain is rewired to function in some way that differ from how it previously functioned. It takes between 18 and 254 days for someone to form a new habit. As for averages, creating a new habit takes an average of 66 days. While measuring your neuroplasticity isn't a practical test you can conduct on your own, you can certainly keep track of your habits to measure the rewiring of your brain. We tend to work new experiences into our existing cognitive frameworks, even if the new information has to be reinterpreted or distorted to make it fit into them, a process known as assimilation. In other words, we are likely to cling to existing assumptions and to reject or distort new information that contradicts them. Accommodation or changing our existing frameworks to make it possible to incorporate new information that doesn't fit is more difficult and threatening, especially when important assumptions are challenged. This change in our mental frameworks is the basic goal of our psychological therapies. But as long as we are still operating from the confines of the mind being the sole control center, we will find it hard to outgrow its flaws. Our mental frameworks cause us to exclude pertinent information and to focus instead only on things that confirm our pre-existing beliefs and ideas. This is in part because we are usually not completely conscious of our mental frameworks. In other words, although our daily decisions and behavior are largely shaped by these frames of reference, we may be unaware of the assumptions on which they are based or even think that we are not making any assumptions at all. We think that we are simply seeing things the way they are and often do not consider the fact that other views might be possible or that other rules of reality or viewpoints might exist. More than 50% of people in the world have dealt with some form of mental illness at some point in their lives. Where did we learn that? When mental illnesses are present on such a large scale, we have to begin looking at large scale influences such as the overarching constructs within a culture if we are to determine a cause. It's truly remarkable to ponder the notion that had you been revered in the same way you were as a pure, innocent baby, cradled in love and profound acceptance, you would never have had to devise schemes or strive to create adaptations to earn the unconditional love that your soul craves to feel understood. The majority of individuals who struggle with self-hatred actually detest their adaptations but mistake these adaptations for their true identity. They hate the version of themselves that was spurned by a parent, ignored by a caregiver, and unloved by the environment because they believe it must signify some inherent defect that renders them unlovable or undeserving of care. If your inner world had been reflected and validated by the external world, you would have never arrived at the conclusion that there was anything flawed or unlovable about you. You wouldn't have encountered the sense of isolation and existential horror that arises from feeling rejected. And you wouldn't still be grappling with anxiety that stems from this deeply primordial experience to this day. However, it's not too late to recognize this within yourself. Beneath all the adaptations and obscurations you've amassed along your journey, you're still that pure, unblemished being. Perhaps in hell too, we will create religions, gods, drinks, drugs and other forms of pleasure to help us cope with misery. Or maybe we don't need hell because we already have all of that and your hell is here on earth. Perhaps it is only a state of lower consciousness and some of us have already experienced hell. Perhaps hell is the suffering of being unable to love. If you want to get a better understanding of words, go to the language they were taken from and get those meanings. The word sin was derived from the Hebrew words chait or chatter, meaning missing the mark or a doorway that leads to another realm or to separate or to be cut off. So just what mark are we missing? What are we separated or cut off from? The non-physical aspects of ourselves, the kingdom of heaven that is within us. And what is the doorway to another realm that we have entered? That is the realm of rational thought, or we can say, man's will. We think our egos are ourselves, but all it is, is the accumulated beliefs we develop from our social world since childhood. We are adopting other people's illusions as our own, and operating subconsciously from that false paradigm. What we rationalize is only the result of our experience with the physical world. 
In other words, in our rationality we are victims of physicality. Until we can tap into those larger parts of ourselves that are beyond rational thought and our physical selves. The non-physical states of inner reality which creates and sustains all other realities, we will be bound to only a small aspect of our existence. The mind was supposed to be able to open the door to our internal world but in our industrialized world today and our identification with the mind as who we are, the mind has become a gatekeeper which prevents us from entering. It guards the gate of other superior human functions by making sure individuals do not grow beyond the level of thinking which is common to their society. The individual assumes that being different will result in being an outlaw and disgrace. So the mind guards the outer reputation at the expense of the inner life. Our primary objective of being present in this realm is to confront and resolve various difficulties and obstacles that come our way. However, it is crucial to be conscious of our internal consciousness and non-physical being, which to a considerable extent has been obscured from our awareness. Our preoccupation with the material world has caused us to overlook the existence of our spiritual and metaphysical selves, which are equally essential aspects of our existence. We have become so engrossed in the tangible and perceptible aspects of life that we have lost touch with our non-physical reality, leading to a limited understanding of the multifaceted nature of our existence. Is there something beyond the physical, beyond the mind and beyond the emotions which will cause individuals to have an inner experience which is great enough to dominate their physical, mental and emotional attributes and therefore give persons back to the leadership of the best part of themselves? Some people think the physical body is the best part of humans, some think the mind is the best part of humans and some think the emotions or the heart is the best part. But all of these finally come under the leadership of that which dwells within the body, behind the mind and beyond the emotions. What is this basis of reality? How are we going to get beyond the mind's aloofness? And just how far within does one have to go to get to the root of being, behind those veils where the spark lives? 